Hello and welcome to our latest imaging webinar entitled Radiographic Appearance of Heart Disease. Now this follows on from our last webinar which was entitled Radiographic Assessment of Heart Disease. Now before we get into the finer details, a little introduction. My name is Ian Jones and I'm a radiologist. I graduated from the RVC in 2004 and I got my imaging certificate in 2009. I went back to the RVC to do my imaging residency between 2013 and 2016 and I got my European diploma in 2018. And you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is a multidisciplinary referral hospital in North London. If you have any questions about any cases that you think might benefit from any sort of imaging and you're wondering which would be the best imaging modality, or if you have some radiographs that you need a hand with, please feel free to drop me a line um, or send me an email. Now, this uh, series of webinars draws heavily from the textbook of veterinary diagnostic radiology, which was edited by uh, uh, Don Thrall. This is the textbook that I spent most time with during my residency, and I would highly recommend it if you're interested in improving your knowledge as a radiologist. In the last webinar, we talked about how to use thoracic radiographs to assess the heart and to decide whether or not a patient has primary heart disease. And we broke that down by answering three specific questions. The first question being, is the heart too big? If the heart is too big and the patient does have primary heart disease, do we think that the heart disease is predominantly left-sided or predominantly right-sided. And we talked about how you can assess all of the individual heart chambers and the major vessels. And finally, we touched on how to tell whether that patient is in heart failure. So building on that knowledge, we're now going to talk about how specific heart diseases appear on thoracic radiographs. Now, the most common types of heart disease that you're likely to encounter in first opinion practice are mitral valve disease, dilated cardiomyopathy, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And essentially, if it's a small dog with heart disease, and by a small dog, I mean a dog that you can pick up, it probably has mitral valve disease. If it's a big dog, so if you're not able to pick this dog up because it's too big and it has heart disease, it's probably got DCM. And if it's a cat, it's probably got HCM. Now, that doesn't apply universally. And obviously, there are many more different types and forms of heart disease that can present in small animal practice. But in the main, those are the ones that we're going to see most commonly. Now, occasionally, we're going to see other types of heart disease in first opinion practice, pericardial effusions, for example, and we'll talk about that during this webinar, um, pulmonic stenosis and aortic stenosis. And then finally, we'll talk very briefly about common types of congenital heart disease, um, so PDAs and VSDs. So let's start with the heart disease that we're all most familiar with, so mitral valve disease. So uh, all of us will have come across Cavalier King Charles Spaniels with heart murmurs and leaky mitral valves. And the reason why a leaky mitral valve is a problem is because it leads to left-sided volume overload. And because of that volume overload, the pressure within the left atrium is increased. And following on from that, the uh, pressure within the pulmonary veins is increased. And that eventually leads to left-sided failure. On thoracic radiographs, we're gonna see an enlarged left atrium and ventricle. We're gonna see big pulmonary veins, and if that patient has decompensated, we're gonna see signs of left-sided failure. So let's look at some radiographs of a dog with mitral valve disease. We have a lateral and a dorsoventral radiograph to review. In both views, the heart is very large. And in the lateral view, uh, we can see that there is a quite significant steepening of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette, 
which is compatible with left atrial enlargement. You can see this big bulge here that represents an enlarged left atrium at the uh, quarter dorsal aspect of the cardiac silhouette. That big bulgy left atrium is, is pushing the trachea dorsally. So we have dorsal displacement of, of the trachea and it's pretty tricky for us to see the lumen of the main stem bronchi. So it's possible that there could be some compression of the main stem bronchi here. In the DV radiographs, uh, we have this double wall sign where the markedly enlarged left atrium is superimposed on the remainder of the cardiac silhouette, creating uh, this curved margin towards the cardiac apex on the left. And there may even be a little bit of bronchial divergence here as well as a result of that enlarged left atrium. So the angle of bronchial diversions being increased because the left atrium is pushing the main stem bronchi apart, um, often called the, the cowboy sign. So those are the main radiographic features of mitral valve disease, a markedly enlarged left atrium and uh, cardiomegaly resulting in dorsal displacement of the trachea and increase in the angle of bronchial divergence. And if a patient is decompensating and going into left-sided failure, then we might even see an increase in size of the pulmonary veins and an increase in opacity of the pulmonary parenchyma, which typically is centered in the hilar region and then in the dorsocaudal thorax. For dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, certainly <coughs> the dog that I saw with DCM most commonly is, is a Doberman, um, but other breeds can get it as well. So um, Irish Wolfhounds and Great Danes uh, are not just really big dogs, uh, so Cocker Spaniels can get dilated cardiomyopathy as well. So DCM results in impaired systolic function, and because of that uh, impaired systolic, systolic function and the dysfunction of the myocardium, you get secondary mitral regurgita regurgitation. So you get a leaky mitral valve as a result of uh, reduced contractility of the myocardium. And that's going to result in an increase in pulmonary venous pressure, the same way that mitral valve disease results in an increase in pulmonary venous pressure. Radiographically, we're going to see a big left atrium, and we may or may not see uh, evidence of generalized cardiomegaly. So let's take a look at some radiographs of a dog with DCM. So we have a lateral and a ventrodorsal radiograph. We can see in the lateral radiograph again that we have steepening of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette and this bulge, which represents the enlarged left atrium. And in the VD radiograph, uh, we can see we have again some divergent main stem bronchi, so an increase in the angle of bronchial divergence. In this dog, if we look at the pulmonary vein, we can see that it is increased in size relative to the adjacent pulmonary artery. Uh, that pulmonary vein is bigger than the adjacent rib. There's also an increase in interstitial opacity of the dorsocaudal thorax relative to the craniventral thorax. So the combination of an increase in size of the pulmonary vein and an increase in interstitial opacity that has a hyla and a dorsocaudal distribution suggests that not only does this dog have DCM, but it's also in early left-sided failure. A HCM or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is due to a reduction in myocardial relaxation. So the myocardium not able to relax completely, resulting in an increase in diastolic pressure. And radiographically, that's going to manifest as cardiomegaly. So the heart's going to look um, markedly enlarged. And typically, particularly in dorsoventral and ventrodorsal radiographs, it's going to have a, a valentine type shape. And that's due to uh, left atrial enlargement. So looking at radiographs of a cat that's been diagnosed with HCM in the lateral radiograph, we can see that there is quite a, a subtle concavity in the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette. And dorsally and caudally, we've got a, a subtle 
convexity or bulge. <clears throat> and that's usually all you see in cats that have left atrial enlargement, at least on a lateral view. So the radiographic change is not anywhere near as uh, obvious as a dog that has an enlarged left atrium as a result of DCM or mitral valve disease. Now in the VD view, here we've got this beautiful, typical valentine shaped heart that is much bigger than it should be. So this heart is occupying almost the entire width of the thoracic cavity. And this valentine shaped heart is due to the enlarged left atrium. So in the VD radiograph, the, the left atrium is sitting around here and causing this valentine shape as well as the cardiac size and assessing the cardiac chambers, we should also always remember to assess the pulmonary vasculature. And in this lateral view, uh, the pulmonary vasculature looks pretty normal in size. So we've got the artery, the bronchus and the vein, and the vein may be ever so slightly enlarged relative to the artery, but not bigger than the adjacent rib. But in this VD view, these pulmonary vessels look, look really chunky. Um, so we've got um, a very large artery and a very large vein. So it could be that this cat is also heading towards early failure. Pericardial effusion has a number of different causes. Uh, it could be uh, idiopathic. Uh, it could be as a result of heart failure, or it could be neoplastic. So uh, there are various different sorts of heart-based tumors that can result in pericardial effusion. So hemangiosarcoma associated with the right atrial appendage or say a, a larger chemodectoma at the base of the heart that can result in fluid accumulating in the pericardial sac. There are other things that can cause pericardial effusion uh, that they're more uncommon. So infectious disease, for example. So if a patient has a, <coughs> a migrating foreign body, uh, that can sometimes result in pericardial effusion. <coughs> Cats with <coughs> FIP can present with a pericardial effusion. A patient that's coagulopathic can have a pericardial effusion, and that could be as a result of uh, some sort of parasitic infestation like lungworm um, or a toxicity, like a redentocyte toxicity. And patients that have sustained trauma um, can have a pericardial effusion as a result of blood accumulating within the pericardial sac. <coughs> the fluid that accumulates within the pericardium uh, essentially pre prevents the right atrium from completely filling. And as a result of that, you get um, cardiac tamponade and the tamponade results <coughs> in uh, an impaired ventricular filling. On <coughs> thoracic radiographs, uh, the pericardial effusion is going to appear as an enlarged heart that has quite a, a globoid shape. Um, so the heart will appear big and round on thoracic radiographs. So here's some thoracic radiographs from a patient that has a pericardial effusion. So we've got a left lateral radiograph and a dorsoventral radiograph. In both of these views, the heart looks enormous um, and round. So in the lateral view, we've definitely lost the normal tapering of the margins of the cardiac silhouette towards the apex. And that's also true of the DV view. So both of these hearts look really big and really round. Now, there are other things that can, be, can result in a big globoid heart. So DCM, for example, can sometimes appear like a more like a generalized cardiomegaly rather than just an enlarged left atrium. And, and there are other things like um, peritoneal pericardio diaphragmatic hernias that can result in big globoid hearts. So if there's any doubt at all as to whether or not a patient has a pericardial effusion after your assessment of the thoracic radiographs, then and we can just pop the ultrasound probe on the chest and just take a second to uh, see if there is indeed fluid within the pericardial space. And that, that will clear up any doubt at all that what we're looking at here is a pericardial effusion. The 
Pulmonic stenosis uh, is something that we're most likely to see in uh, bulldog type breeds, uh, although there are lots of other breeds where it's been reported, um, including uh, terriers, beagles, schnauzers, and chihuahuas. And for pulmonic stenosis, uh, what uh, happens as a result of that narrowed pulmonic outflow is you have an increase in afterload on the right side of the heart. Now, radiographically, that's going to manifest as an enlarged main pulmonary artery, an enlarged right ventricle, and under perfusion of the pulmonary vessels. So if we take a look at some radiographs of a patient that has pulmonic stenosis, we have a left lateral view and we have a dorsoventral view. In the lateral view, um, we can see that the heart looks bigger than it should be. And also there's an increase in sternal contact uh, and slight elevation of the cardiac apex. In the DV view, Again, the heart looks a little bit bigger than it should do, and we've got this bulge between one and two o'clock. So if we think back to the clock face analogy that we covered in the previous webinar, having a bulge between one and two o'clock fits with an enlarged pulmonary artery. Now, not only do we have this bulge between one and two o'clock, if we look at the shape of the heart in this DV view, then it has this this reverse D shape that's typical of right-sided enlargement. So the combination of cardiomegaly, an increase in sternal contact, and a slight raising of the cardiac apex in the lateral view, and the reverse D shape of the enlarged heart in the DV view, as well as this bulge between one and two o'clock, suggests that the pulmonary artery is enlarged and we've got evidence of, of right-sided enlargement. And all of that uh, is typical of a patient that has pulmonic stenosis. Aortic stenosis, uh, not something that uh, I've seen um, that often, particularly when I was in first opinion practice. Uh, there are uh, several breeds where we need to uh, watch out for it, and that would include breeds like um, Golden Retrievers, German Shepherds, and Newfoundlands. And for aortic stenosis, uh, we've got this narrowed aortic outflow. So this time we have an increased afterload on the left side of the heart. And for aortic stenosis, uh, we're going to see on thoracic radiographs an enlarged aorta. Uh, we're going to see an enlarged left atrium and an enlarged left ventricle. So we have <coughs> two radiographs of a dog with aortic stenosis. We have a right lateral radiograph and a dorsoventral radiograph. In the lateral radiograph, we can see the cran cranially and dorsally. Um, there's a bulge that represents an enlarged aorta. And on the DV radiograph, we can see that there's this bulge between 12 and one o'clock, which represents an increase in size of uh, one of the major vessels, in this case, and enlarged aorta. So the combination of this bulge on the cranial and dorsal aspect of the heart and this bulge between 12 and one o'clock uh, is typical of a patient with aortic stenosis. We're just going to touch on a congenital heart disease and the most common sort of congenital defect that you're likely to see in small animal practice is a patent ductus arteriosus. So if we think back to our anatomy to remind ourselves of exactly what the ductus is and what it does, we have a diagram here of the fetal circulation and a diagram of an adult circulatory system. And in the fetal circulation, we can see that we have the pulmonary artery and we have the aorta and we have the ductus that joins the pulmonary artery to the aorta that then takes the blood to the placenta for oxygenation, effectively bypassing the lungs, which uh, in, the, in the fetus are not functional. In the adult circulation, the PDA closes up and regresses and the pulmonary artery 
takes the blood to the lungs to be oxygenated. So patients that have a patent ductus arteriosus, this, this ductus remains open. So there's a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Now, radiographically, that's going to manifest as an enlarged aorta, an enlarged pulmonary artery, an enlarged left atrium, and big pulmonary vessels. So let's take a look at some radiographs of a patient with a patent ductus arteriosus. Again, we have a lateral and we have a DV radiograph. These radiographs not from the same dog. In the lateral radiograph, if we look at the cranial lobar pulmonary vessels, we can see that they look pretty chunky. So both the artery and the vein uh, look to be enlarged in this patient. And that's typically something that you'll see in a dog with a PDA. Uh, you might also see enlargement of the left atrium on a lateral view. In the DV view, uh, the heart certainly looks to be enlarged. Um, it's occupying more than 60% of the width of that thoracic cavity. And we can see we have a couple of bulges. So we have um, a bulge uh, between one and two o'clock, and we have a bulge between two and three o'clock. Now this, this bulge between one and two o'clock is an enlarged pulmonary artery, and this bulge between two and three o'clock is an enlarged left auricle. And for patients with PDAs, that's often described as, as looking like knuckles. So these, these bulges appearing um, like knuckles of a clenched fist. Now, you can also sometimes see a bulge between 11 and 1 o'clock, which represents an enlarged aorta. I think it's pretty tricky to see in, in this patient, but typically you can see a bulge between 11 and 1, which is the big aorta, a bulge between 1 and 2, which is the enlarged pulmonary artery, and then a bulge between 2 and 3, which is the left auricle. In, in this patient, I think the bulges between 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 are much more obvious, but the presence of, of those knuckles is, is pretty typical of a PDA, and those are the things that you're going to look for to really uh, nail the diagnosis down. So finally, for uh, cats, the most congenital uh, most common congenital defect that you're likely to see is a VSD or a ventricular septal defect. Uh, for uh, patients with ventricular septal defects, they often have uh, left to right shunts. Um, so the pressure on the left side of the heart is usually much greater than the pressure on the right. So the blood's going to flow from left to right. Uh, normally, uh, once it's shifted from left to right, um, it uh, shoots up, up the left ventricular, the right ventricular outflow tract. And as a result of that, the afterload is usually more pronounced on the left relative to the right. Now, radiographically, that's going to manifest as a big heart. So you're going to see cardiomegaly. Uh, you might see left atrial enlargement and also um, some big pulmonary vessels. So we'll, finally, we'll take a look at a couple of radiographs from some cats that have ventricular septal defects. We have a lateral radiograph and a ventrodorsal radiograph. Uh, in the lateral radiograph, I mean, really all we can see is a big heart. So uh, this heart is um, much bigger than it should be. Um, not really any convincing evidence of left atrial enlargement here. We're not seeing um, that concavity and then the, associate, the associated quarter-dorsal bulge, but certainly um, a big heart. And in the VD radiograph, again, I think what we can really see here is a heart that's a little bigger than it should be, um, and also um, some big pulmonary vessels. And that's typically what uh, you would see radiographically uh, in a cat that has a ventricular septal defect. Um, quite tricky to diagnose, and certainly something that is going to require um, an echo um, to be confident. So hopefully you guys will now feel a little bit more confident about assessing the heart radiographically and also uh, diagnosing common forms of heart disease in small animal patients. Uh, thank you very much for listening and if you guys uh, would like to uh, learn more about imaging and a variety of other subjects uh, please visit our uh, YouTube channel and check out our other webinars. In the meantime I wish everybody well and I wish uh, everybody uh, to stay safe and I will catch up with you all again very soon. Thank you very much.
Bye-bye.